be here today uh, to talk to you about tuberous sclerosis. Uh, just so I can get a sense of the audience, how many here are parents? Okay, wonderful. And how many here are health providers, professionals, therapists? Okay, good. We have, we have somebody to call. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I have two talks today. The first is about TSC in general. Uh, and then the second talk, we'll talk a lot more about the research studies that we do as it pertains to autism, uh, which is the focus of the conference today. Um, it's tradition, any time I give a medical talk, then you know who pays me, so that you know whether I'm working for somebody or not. Um, and I have I've done work with Novartis uh, Pharmaceuticals, uh, who makes uh, one of the drugs that we use in two years' course called Everlimus. Um, but I'm not here for Novartis today. I've also done work for another medication we use to treat epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis uh, that's made by Malincrack Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then the rest of my salary comes from my hospital and then from several uh, foundations and the National Institutes of Health that pays for the research that I do in tuberous sclerosis. So when we talk about tuberous sclerosis, it is a genetic disease. It is uh, in the DNA. There are two genes that cause tuberous sclerosis. One is TSC1, and the other gene is TSC2. And we'll talk about that by the end of today on, on the importance that has for us. But to know that it's genetic means that it can be passed on from a parent to their child. Although most cases of tuberous sclerosis, it occurs for the first time in the child. The parents don't have it. Um, and there's nothing that the parents have done to cause this. It's just one of those things that the DNA sometimes can have a mutation. And if it's in TSC1 or TSC2 on these two different chromosomes, then the child will have tuberous sclerosis. We did a study a couple years ago, and other people have done similar studies, of these two genes. And most patients will have a mutation in the second gene, TSC2. It's bigger and it's more common. But there are another group of patients that will have a mutation in that TSC1 gene. One of the things we look for to see if there's any spots in the protein where the mutation is most likely to occur. Because in the future, when we think about gene therapy, uh, that's going to be pretty important for us to be able to use. In, in TSC, we don't have any one spot. It doesn't mean that gene therapy won't be an option down the road, but it's going to be a little bit harder for us to do it. Uh, and there's going to be some other diseases that, that get gene therapy before we do. But, but it will happen someday. Now, a lot of times we'll do genetic testing to look for the specific mutation in TSC1 or TSC2, and we don't always find a mutation um, in that testing, but the patient still has all the other aspects of TSC. And what we have learned now is that in those patients, most likely there's something we call a mosaic. And a mosaic means that not every cell in the body has the mutation, just some in the eyes, or some in the skin, or some in the brain, but not everywhere. And that can make the genetic testing negative, even though the child still has tuberous sclerosis. So this is important to note that we don't always do genetic testing to make a diagnosis, because we know sometimes we won't see these on the test. So we really depend on the doctors to say, you have tuberous sclerosis. And if the doctors are sure, then, that is, then we don't need the DNA testing to tell them. If the doctors are unsure, if maybe there's some things that look like tuberous sclerosis, but some things that don't, then the DNA testing can be helpful to make that, that diagnosis. The other time we do DNA testing is if we want to help the parents know about whether they'll have more children with tuberous sclerosis. And that can be a very helpful for us to help make that uh, counsel, that advice to them. The other reason why we started doing uh, DNA testing is because a long time ago, um, this is a big study by, by one of my friends, Dr. Gabora, who looked at 220 patients with tuberous sclerosis and then looked at their DNA mutations that they each had. And this is where we found out that most patients have a TSC2 mutation. Um, it's also where we found out that patients with TSC2 mutations are more likely to have a severe form of the disease. That they will have more autism or they will have more epilepsy or they will have more tumors in their kidneys. And I will talk about all that in just a moment. Um, but it also highlighted the fact that there's a lot of variation. So there are some patients with TSC1 that can have all of those things, can have epilepsy, can have autism. But there are some patients with TSC2 that have none of that. 
But in general, if we took all those patients together, the TSC2 patients tend to have more of those than the TSC1. We also are now starting to find that there are some mutations that we can predict are less severe just because of where they are found in the genes. And so we can do TSC mutations, and there's a, these are three papers that have been published in the last couple of years that say if you have this mutation, you're very likely to have very mild tumor sclerosis. Um, we need to do more of these studies to get more than just these specific mutations. So with the rest of the time, I'm going to run through all the clinical signs of somebody who has tuberous sclerosis. The first is the skin manifestations. And the classic are these little dots. They almost look like acne. Um, and they can happen, obviously, your skin color doesn't matter. Um, and these usually appear in school years. Sometimes preschool around three or four, but most patients is around four, five, six, or seven years of age. And then as they go through puberty, they can get bigger and more in number. Um, and so this is a very, a very common version of TSC that we see. Some of the older patients, particularly those who are teenagers or adults, can get larger spots. And these are what we call plaques. And we call them cephalic plaques because they happen on the head. And we used to call them forehead plaques, but now we know they can be anywhere on the head. And they are just uh, rough growth on the skin. Now these don't cause any type of symptoms per se, unless they get big and they can bleed. Um, and, uh, but we will send them to a plastic surgeon from time to time when they are bleeding or when they are very embarrassing for the child or for the adults uh, to have a plastic surgeon. Uh, they can uh, either do surgery or even laser treatments. Other common manifestations are the white spots, uh, the birthmarks uh, that these children have. Usually we can see these in the nursery when the baby, before the baby goes home, but sometimes it may be a few months before we can actually see them well. Um, and so it may be a pediatrician visit a few months later that these become evident. In the teenagers and better than the adults, we can get little tumors that grow along the fingernails and the toenails. Uh, and these likewise can be sent to a plastic surgeon or a foot surgeon to treat if they are bleeding or if they're hurting the patient. And then the last skin manifestation that we see is what we call a shagreen patch. And this is just a rough area of skin. It's another type of birthmark, but instead of being white, it's usually skin color and it's just rough so you can feel it rather than see it. The next part of the body that tuber stroke can affect are the eyes. And the most common thing we see that this happens, and this will be present usually in babies, but it can show up here in school. Uh, school years is a tumor of the eye. Uh, these are not malignant, means they don't spread to other parts of the body. But in a few cases, they can cause separation of the layers of the eye, which would be uh, can cause blindness. So our recommendation is, is that patients go see the eye doctor every year just to check and see if there's any evidence of any complications from this. Even though it's rare, the eyes are so important, we just feel like that's an important recommendation to take care of. The other thing we see is that sometimes we'll see white spots in the eye, and then the ophthalmologist may see that. And these don't have any clinical significance. They're the same thing as white spots on the skin or the hair. Uh, they're just something that we can see in the eye uh, because of the pigmentation. There's a lot of other more rare aspects of TSC, and none of these things are things that we use to diagnose tumor sclerosis. But we can have areas of de uh, depigmentation of the iris. You can get eyelashes that are white. Uh, you can get uh, plaques on the eyebrows. Uh, you can get what we call a coloboma, which is instead of a round pupil, you get a funny shaped pupil. Uh, those are things that happen in tumor sclerosis as well, but they're not, you see them in other things besides tumor sclerosis. So, uh, so the real ones we pay attention to are these tumors that occur in the eyes. All right, so the next uh, aspect is the heart. And um, these are ultrasounds of the heart, uh, what we call echocardiograms. And you can see that the heart is beating here. Here, each of these black areas is one of the chambers that uses to pump blood. And then over here, and here's another small one, and there's a tiny one over here, you see and see that these are, these are tumors of the heart. And if they get really big, the heart can't pump the blood. Um, this is uh, usually present at birth, so the doctor may hear a murmur. Um, or if the patient is diagnosed with tumor sclerosis, the doctors know that they need to do one of these studies to take a look at this to make sure the heart's okay. 
as the child gets older, these will either stay the same or they will actually shrink and go away. So the most critical time that we pay attention to these things is usually when the baby is born and then for the next year or two. And then after that, if they haven't grown any further and the heart's pumping okay, we stop taking these pictures. Um, and uh, the only thing we do is we pay attention to how the heart has its conduction so that the people don't have arrhythmias. And so we check that every five years. And here we can see that the blood is getting through the heart past these tumors, uh, which is uh, good. And so this, this is a baby that even though she had these tumors, uh, if her heart was okay and we didn't have to do any treatment. Now the next common area that we find tumor sclerosis is in the kidneys. And there's two types of things that we pay attention to the kidneys. The first are tumors, um, which we call angiomyelitomas. So this is what a normal kidney should look like, right here and right here. This is abnormal. This is a tumor that's growing on the side of the kidney. Um, again, these are not malignant. They are not cancer. But they can grow and push on the kidneys and make them not work as well. And the other, and so, and, and this is an extreme case of one of my patients. So she's in her 20s, and you cannot find any normal kidney here on her CAT scan. Uh, and uh, this is just one big tumor over here, and this is one big tumor over here. And in fact, she looks like she's expecting a baby because the tumors are so big. Um, and, and they're so big that we can't really operate on them, so we're using some of our new medicines to try to shrink them. And she's doing well so far. The other aspect of tumor sclerosis we see are these cysts, which are these white spots on this, on this uh, MRI. And what these are are just pockets of fluid in the kidneys. And if you get too many of those, they can also cause the kidney not to function correctly. In the extreme cases, in babies, um, we can see where we have what we call polycystic kidneys, where all the kidney is gone, and it's just replaced by, by cysts. These patients usually need transplantation sometime early in their childhood. Uh, and uh, and what, what's important for there is that these may not be present in the baby's core, but usually we can see them by the time they're a year old. And so we do recommend getting an ultrasound or an MRI of a baby as soon as they're born, and then also to we'll repeat this every year um, to make sure that doesn't happen. Another aspect of tumor sclerosis is that it can affect the lungs. When it does affect the lungs, we call that lymph angiomyomatosis, which in English is horrible to say. So we shorten it and we say lamb. Lamb is what we call this. Uh, and this is a chest x-ray. This is uh, a normal lung. And you see how this one's very black? That's a lung that has collapsed. It's ruptured. And now it's just full of air. Uh, but it's, uh, that air has escaped the lung. And so this is very, very painful. This is one of the complications that lamb can have. Otherwise, what we see is, and it's hard to see in this image, but what we see is lots of little pockets of air. Instead of little tiny microscopic pockets, they get big enough where they can break like a balloon. Okay. This only happens in women. None of the men in tumor sclerosis get this. And it only happens in adult women. So the children don't get this at all. It's because that you need estrogen to make this happen in tumor sclerosis. And so it's only after a, uh, a girl has gone through her change and starts having monthly cycles and making estrogen uh, at high levels that does she run risk of doing this. So we do a CAT scan in all of our adult women patients every five years to make sure that this isn't happening. And then obviously, if a TSC uh, female were to come to the emergency room difficulty breathing, we would worry about her having a collapsed lung, which is one of the ways that this presents itself. If, if earlier than that, they often act like they have asthma, uh, where they have trouble breathing with exercise or when the pollution is bad. That's another sign to go see uh, a pulmonary specialist uh, to see if this is going on um, uh, as the reason. All right, so with the remainder of my time, we're going to talk about the brain. And the reason why we pay attention to the brain is that this affects 90% of patients with tumor sclerosis. And when you ask patients which part of TSC most scares them, it's the brain. It's the epilepsy, and it's the learning difficulties, and it's the autism. On an MRI, we, uh, if we have a patient who has new seizures, one of the things we'll try to do is get pictures of their brain. And 
we can see these little stains in different parts of the brain. Here's one right here. And these are what we call tubers. And this is why we call it tuberous sclerosis. Um, these are like little, very hard, non-functioning parts of the brain. Um, but they, because they're there, we tend to have lots of clinical manifestations. We also get these little growths, and these are called nodules, and if they start getting bigger, we call them giant subastrocytomas. Again, this is a type of tumor, but it's not considered cancer in the classic sense because it doesn't get malignant, but it can cause blockage of pathways in the brain that can ultimately cause lots of complications. And this is an example of that. This is a patient who was two years old, and we got an MRI, because that's the recommendation, is to check and see if they have any growth. And we see at that point he had a small growth in the center of his brain. Because we didn't know if it was growing or not, we repeated that scan in three years, and we see that it has gotten bigger. And at that point, he wanted to enroll into one of our studies to treat it instead of surgery, brain surgery, he wanted to try medicine instead. But the trial wasn't ready on time. So we did another scan to make sure it wasn't causing any complications. And you can see even like after half a year, it's continued to grow. At some point, it can be like this. And uh, this is a patient of ours uh, that was not coming to clinic. We tried to get them to come to clinic, but they couldn't come. Uh, and then uh, finally, he was having trouble walking, and he was having headaches, and he was having trouble seeing. And, uh, and he started throwing up, and so he went to the emergency room, and they were able to see that he had a big, large tumor. This is another one of my patients uh, who had a tumor operated on, but they didn't operate it on completely, and a few months later, it had grown really big. And in this case, you see that the fluid is very much backed up, it's getting blocked, and this is why the patients start to have these symptoms of, of they almost act like they're drunk, they can't walk straight, they throw up a lot, and they eventually they will die if they don't get mercy treatment. So I want to spend some time talking about the rest of tuberous sclerosis. And so seizures are one of the consequences of, of tuberous sclerosis, and they usually happen in the first few years of life. There are some patients who may have seizures later, but most of them have them very early. And we have lots of different seizure types. Um, these are all different um, abbreviations for uh, types of epilepsy. Uh, but the most common are what we call focal seizures, and these tend to be those seizures where only part of the body is have a little twitch, um, or the patient is staring and not responding to you, um, uh, are the two most common focal seizure types that we see in tumor sclerosis. The other types we see in babies are what are called infantile spasms, where the baby will jerk, and then be okay, and then maybe we'll trip again, and then be okay. Uh, and, and the reason why we care about that, particularly in the babies, is because it causes them to be development and delay. The seizures are related to how well the brain can continue to learn like it should learn, talk like it should talk, walk like it should learn how to walk. And this is an example of a study that we did where we looked at learning until the uh, babies were 24 months of age, what you see here is in the dark circle, as it goes further to the right, means they're falling further and further behind. And we see at six months, they're a little bit behind who have epilepsy. By 12 months, the gap between here and here is getting bigger, meaning they're falling further and further behind. And so that's why we really pay attention really so much to epilepsy. We also see that this is true for autism. In patients you see here with green, the likelihood of having autism behaviors is much higher in those who have seizures. Uh, and we see this both at 12 months of age, and then we see it again at 24 months of age. These are the patients without seizures. These are the patients with seizures. You see how much more autism that they have. So, Autism is just one part of how a child learns and behaves in, a, in its relation to TSC. <laughs> Several years ago, about five years ago, we met 70 specialists of, uh, of tuberous sclerosis, clinicians, and researchers, 
and worked on recommendations that we could give to the whole world on how to take care of patients with tuberous sclerosis. They came, these 70 specialists came from all over the world. And when it came to learning and behavior, and they gave us this term called TSC Associated Neuropsych Neuropsychiatric Disorder, or TAN. And what this does is that it really it says that all these things are interrelated to each other. And so your learning, you know, and how well you speak is over here. And those patients who can't do that, we call, we say have intellectual disability. Then we have patients who have trouble with their behavior. And this is where autism uh, plays a role. And then we don't talk about this very much, but there's also a lot of anxiety in tumor sclerosis and a lot of, of compulsions. And, um, and this is also related to learning and development as well. And so we really say you really shouldn't study autism by itself if you're going to learn how to take care of patient TSC. But you should actually know that it's part of this bigger constellation of TAN. And if you get the best response, you really need to think about each one of these circles when you design your therapy plans. You know, because some patients, when they see a new therapist, they're going to get so anxious, they're not going to want to do any of the work. You know, so you have to work on how to get over their anxiety so that they can work with the therapist. But if they don't understand what the therapist is telling them, well, then you have to get really creative on how you work with that individual so that they can try to progress. And then ultimately, if they're autistic, that creates a whole new level of how you have to engage that person to be able to get them to participate. So what is, what is the aspects that we see in tumor sclerosis? Well, this is a study that was done in England many, many years ago. Um, and we see that almost half of patients with tumor sclerosis will have autism or autism spectrum disorder. We see poor eye contact and about as many. And then we see a lot of the ritualistic behaviors which go with autism. And even more patients that they don't meet formal criteria for autism, but we'll see those ritualistic behaviors, the hand wrap, hand waving, um, is one of the common ones that we'll see uh, in them. We also see a lot of just problem behaviors, uh, over, uh, very uh, uh, sensory. Uh, we have a lot of sensory issues in our patients with tuberous sclerosis. Uh, we see a lot of impulsivity, a lot of attention deficits. Um, and so we have to uh, uh, really uh, approach those as well. We do see some self-injurious behavior. Biting is one of those we'll see. Uh, pinching or clawing is another one. Um, and, uh, and sometimes that's often directed towards the mother. And so when I see patients in the clinic, I pay attention to the mothers uh, and to make sure they don't have bruises and stuff, especially when they're trying to get big, uh, uh, because they, they often will, will lash out their mothers. And that's very difficult, obviously. And then, as I mentioned, we do see some of these mood disorders. Uh, there's some depression mood. We do have some social shyness, but I think some of this is social deficits. Um, but we do see a lot of anxiety and compulsions, obsessive compulsion disorders. And so we do pay attention to those and treat those as well. When do we see these symptoms? Well, we see them as early as their first birthday. It's hard to make a diagnosis in this age because there's a lot of things that babies can be behind on that we know they'll get later. Um, but we do see a lot of problems with eye contact. Uh, we do see where babies are kind of uh, not paying attention to things going on in the room that normally a baby should take interest in. When, when there's a person who walks the room, they should look at them. Uh, those kind of things. Uh, so those are some of the things we look for in the babies at, at 12 months as to whether they make good eye contact or whether they react to other people or other things going on in the room. We pay attention to their communication. Now babies at one year of age may or may not have their first words, mama, papa. But many, they should. But even still, there's other things we can look for. Are they babbling? They ba 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 ma 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 ma. And some of them are not, and that's a warning sign to tell us that they're already having problems with communication. All right. Um, and then uh, interest in behaviors. Do they do they pay attention to things like toys um, or other other things, balloons, bright things, uh, or objects? Uh, this is probably the hardest one because sometimes babies just don't care. Uh, but this, we can see these things at 12 months. And at 24 months, we can start to use the normal tools we use to diagnose somebody officially with autism. Most patients don't get diagnosed with autism until about four to seven years of age. It's not because they don't already have autism, but because they don't get referred properly to the right specialist to make that diagnosis. 
and we know that, that we're already able to make a diagnosis of autism formally by you know, over half the patients by 24 months of age. So how do we try to make sure that patients can get diagnosed appropriately? Well, one of the tools that our group, uh, from this group of experts that they gave us was called the TAN checklist. And these are different questions that can apply to a patient no matter how old they are in order to tell the clinician this patient needs to see a specialist for autism and to see uh, if uh, or, or a psychiatrist or a, or a TNC um, neurologist. We have copies of these, uh, we, have, we have 20 copies, so we can certainly uh, share those with you today uh, and then get more copies uh, uh, to uh, the organizations uh, here at India. But what this is, like I said, it's a checklist, and then there's a, uh, where you put the patient's name, and then there's a series of questions that just ask, how old were you when you did one of certain things? And then they said, do you have trouble with friends? Do you have trouble going to school? Uh, do you have behaviors that are harmful? It's all these questions that look for warning signs that say, is this is something that needs more attention, and we need to uh, try to treat it. So I've talked to you about all the different manifestations of, of, of tuberous sclerosis, and really any part of the body can be affected by TSC. I told you about the brain, I told you about the lungs, I told you about the kidneys, heart, eye, and skin. And it's really these different manifestations that, that cause TSC to look very, very differently in individuals from family to family. Uh, and and some of them are more common. Like I said, this is 90% of patients will have this. About 40% uh, uh, of patients will have this, the lungs. About 80% will have kidney issues. About half will have heart. About half will have eye problems. And about 90% will have some of the skin manifestations. And so this is where it really benefits to have a team of doctors and therapists and different specialists to really work together to make sure a patient gets all the right treatment that they need and gets the appropriate tests that they need to have. The other thing is to know is that TSC can look very different in a baby than what it looks like in a school-aged child than what it looks like in an adult. Some of the manifestations like the brain and the skin and the heart appear in a newborn in, the, in that first year of life. Some of them come later when they're in school age or when they're adolescent. And then some of them come more when they're adolescent or adults. So this is, again, another reason why it helps to have multiple specialists that work together to take care of the of tuberous sclerosis. As I mentioned, we have problems. So we have this diagnostic criteria and management recommendations that were published in 2012. There's two different papers that were published, and these are available on the internet. You don't have to pay for them. Uh, and if you want an easy way to find them, you go to this uh, website address, and this will find both of these papers that talk about everything I talked about today, as well as the recommendations of what you should do as parents for your children or as for uh, uh, health professionals for your patients. Uh, so uh, I'll leave that there, and that will complete this part of the talk. And um, I think, I, I don't know if Dr. Donnie has made it here yet, or she may have me keep going. We'll see. Um, I suppose we have, you want to check and see what's going on? And uh, this is uh, our, our, our team that takes care of tuberous sclerosis in Cincinnati. Um, we're very big. Uh, which is unusual, uh, but it's because we do a lot of the research uh, for TSC as well uh, that I'll talk about in the next talk. Uh, so yeah.